Chapter 23. The Final Chapter. The Lies in Spring and the End of Regency. Peace reigned over King's Landing for the remainder of that year, marred only by the death of Manfred Mudin, Lord of Maidenpool and the last of King Aegon's original regents. His lordship had been failing for some time, never truly having regained his strength after the winter fever, so his passing excited little comment. To take his place upon the council, Lord Rowan turned to Sir Corwin Corbray, Lady Raina's husband. Her sister, Lady Bela, meanwhile returned to Driftmark with Lord Allen and their daughter. Not long after, Prince Viserys thrilled the court by announcing that the Lady Lara was with child. All of King's Landing rejoiced. Beyond the city, however, 134 AC would not be a year to remember fondly. North of the Neck, winter still held the land in its icy fist. At Barrowton, Lord Dustin closed his gates as hundreds of starving villagers gathered beneath his walls. White Harbor fared better, for its port allowed food to be brought in from the south, but prices rose so high that good men began to sell themselves into bondage to slave traders from across the sea so their wives and children might eat, whilst worse men sold their wives and children. Even in the winter town, beneath the very walls of Winterfell, the Northmen fell to eating dogs and horses. Cold and hunger carried off a third of the night's watch, and when thousands of wildlings walked across the frozen sea east of the wall, hundreds more of the Black Brothers perished in battle. In the Iron Islands, a savage struggle for power followed upon the death of the Red Kraken. His three sisters and the men they had married seized Torin Greyjoy, the boy upon the seastone chair, and put his mother to death, whilst his cousins joined with the lords of Harlaw and Blacktide to raise up Torin's half-brother Roderick, and the men of Great Wick rallied to a pretender called Sam Salt, who claimed to be descended of the Black Line. Their bloody three-way fight had been raging for half a year when Sir Leo Costain descended upon them with his fleet, landing thousands of Lannister swords and spears on Pike, Great Wick, and Harlaw. Lord Oakenfist had refused to be a part of House Lannister's vengeance upon the Ironmen, but the old sea lion proved more amenable to Lady Johanna's entreaties, swayed, mayhaps, by her promise to marry him if he delivered the Iron Islands to her son's rule. That proved beyond Sir Leo's power to achieve, however. Costain died amidst the stony hills of Great Wick, cut down by the hand of Arthur Goodbrother, and three quarters of his ships were seized or sunk in those cold grey seas. Though Lady Johanna's wish to put every Iron Man to the sword was frustrated, no man could doubt that the Lannisters had paid their debt by the time the fight was done. Hundreds of longships and fishing boats were burned, with as many homes and villages. The wives and children of the Ironborn who had wreaked such havoc on the Westerlands were put to the sword wherever they were found. Amongst the slain were nine of the Red Kraken's cousins, two of his three sisters and their husbands, Lord Drum of Old Wick and Lord Goodbrother of Great Wick, as well as the Lords Volmark and Harlaw of Harlaw, Bodley of Lordsport, and Stonehouse of Old Wick. Thousands more would die of starvation before the year was done, for the Lannisters also carried off many tons of stored grain and salt fish, and despoiled that which they could not carry. Though Torin Greyjoy remained upon the seastone chair when his defenders beat off the Lannister assault upon the walls of Pike, his half-brother Roderick was taken and brought back to Castley Rock, where Lady Johanna had him gelded and made him her son's fool, across the width of Westeros. Another struggle for succession broke out late in the year 134, when Lady Jane Arryn, the Maiden of the Vale, died at Gultown of a cold that had settled in her chest. Forty years of age, she perished in the mother house of Maris on its stony island in the harbor of Gultown, wrapped in the arms of Jessamine Redfort, her dear companion. On her deathbed, her ladyship dictated a last testament, naming her cousin Sir Joffrey Aaron as her heir. Sir Joffrey had served her loyally for the past ten years as Knight of the Bloody Gate, defending the Vale against the savage wildlings of the hills. Sir Joffrey was only a fourth cousin by degree, however. Far closer by blood was Lady Jane's first cousin, Sir Arnold Aaron who had twice attempted to depose her. Imprisoned after his second failed rebellion, Sir Arnold was now quite mad after long years in the Ares sky cells and the dungeons under the gates of the moon. Dot but his son Sir Eldrick Aaron was sane, shrewd, and ambitious, and came forward now to press his father's claim. Many lords of the Vale rallied to his banners, insisting that long-established laws of inheritance could not be put aside by, the whim of a dying woman. A third claimant emerged in the person of one Isambard Aaron, Patriarch of the Gultown Arons, a still more distant branch of that great house. Having split off from their noble kin during the reign of King Jaehaerys, the Gultown Arons had gone into trade and grown rich. Men japed that the falcon on Isambard's arms was made of gold, and he soon became known as the Gilded Falcon. He used that wealth now, 
Bribing lesser lords to support his claim and bringing sellswords across the narrow sea, Lord Rowan did what he could to alleviate these woes, commanding the Lannisters to withdraw from the Iron Islands, shipping food to the north, and summoning the Aran claimants to King's Landing to present their cases to the regents, but his efforts were largely ineffectual. The Lannisters and the Arons alike ignored his decrees, and far too little food arrived at White Harbor to alleviate the famine. Though well liked, neither Thaddeus Rowan nor the boy he served were feared. By year's end, many at court had begun to whisper that it was not the regents who ruled the realm, but rather the money changers of Lee. Though the court and city still doted on the king's brother, that clever, gallant boy Viserys, the same could not be said for his lies and wife. Lara Roger had taken up residence in the Red Keep with her husband, yet in her heart she remained a lady of Lee. Though fluent in High Valyrian and the dialects of Myr, Tyrosh, and Old Volantis in addition to her own lies and tongue, Lady Lara made no effort to learn the common tongue, preferring to rely upon translators to make her wishes known. Her ladies were all Lassini, as were her servants. The gowns she wore all came from Lee, even her small clothes, her father's ships delivered the latest lies and fashions to her thrice a year. She even had her own protectors. Lies and swords guarded her night and day, under the command of her brother Morado and a towering mute from the fighting pits of Marine called Sandok the Shadow. All this the court and kingdom might have come to accept in time, had Lady Lara not also insisted upon keeping her own gods. She would have no part in the worship of the Seven, nor the old gods of the Northmen. Her worship was reserved for certain of the manifold gods of Lee, the six-breasted cat goddess Pantera, Indros of the Twilight who was male by day and female by night, the pale child Bacalon of the Sword, Faceless Sogol, the giver of pain. Her ladies, her servants, and her guards would join Lady Lara at certain times in performing obeisances to these queer, ancient deities. Cats were seen coming and going from her chambers so often that men began to say they were her spies, purring at her in soft voices of all the doings of the Red Keep. It was even said that Lara herself could transform into a cat, to prowl the gutters and rooftops of the city. Darker rumors soon arose. The acolytes of Indros could supposedly transform themselves from male to female and female to male through the act of love, and whispers went about that her ladyship oft availed herself of this ability at twilight orgies, so she might visit the brothels on the street of silk as a man. And every time a child went missing, the ignorant would look at one another and talk of Sogol's insatiable thirst for blood. Even less love than Lara of Lee were the three brothers who had come with her to King's Landing. Morado commanded his sister's guards, whilst Lotho set about establishing a branch of the Rogare bank atop Visenya's hill. Rogario, the youngest, opened an opulent Lysen pillow house called the Mermaid beside the river gate, and filled it with parrots from the summer islands, monkeys from Sothorios, and a hundred exotic girls, and boys, from every corner of the earth. Though their favors cost ten times as much as any other brothel dared to charge, Rogario never lacked for customers. Great lords and common tradesmen alike spoke of the beauties and wonders to be found behind the mermaid's carved and painted doors, including, some said, an actual mermaid. Almost all that we know of the myriad marvels of the mermaid comes to us from Mushroom, who alone amongst our chroniclers is willing to confess to visiting the brothel himself on many occasions and partaking of its many pleasures in sumptuously appointed rooms. Across the sea, the daughter's war finally reached its end. Raclio Rindun fled south to the Basilisk Isles with his remaining supporters, Lee, Tyrosh, and Myr divided the disputed lands, and the Dornish took dominion over most of the stepstones. The Myrish suffered the greatest losses in these new arrangements, whilst the Archon of Tyrosh and the Princess of Dornay gained the most. In Lee, ancient houses fell and many a high-born magister was cast down and ruined, whilst others rose up to seize the reins of power. Chief amongst these was Lysandro Rogare and his brother Drazenko, architect of the Dornish alliance. Drazenko's ties to Sunspear and Lysandro's to the Iron Throne made the Rogers the princes of Lee in all but name. By the end of 134 AC, some feared they might soon rule Westeros as well. Their pride and pomp and power became the talk of King's Landing. Men began to whisper of their wiles. Lotho bought men with gold, Rogario seduced them with perfumed flesh, Morado frightened them into submission with steel. Yet the brothers were no more than puppets in the hands of Lady Lara, it was her and her queer lies and gods who held their strings. The king, the little queen, the young prince, they were only children, blind to what was happening about them, whilst the kingsguard and the gold cloaks and even the king's hand had been bought and sold, or so the stories went. Like all such tales, they had some truth to them, well mixed with fear and falsehood. That the Lassini were proud, grasping, and ambitious cannot be doubted. 
that Lotho used his bank in Rogario his brothel to win friends to their cause goes without saying. Yet in the end they differed but little from many of the other lords and ladies of Aegon the Three Ards Court, all of them pursuing power and wealth in their own ways. Though more successful than their rivals, for a time, at least the Lassini were only one of several factions competing for influence. Had Lady Lara and her brothers been Westerosi, they might have been admired and celebrated, but their foreign birth, foreign ways, and foreign gods made them objects of mistrust and suspicion instead. Munkin refers to this period as the Rogar ascendancy, but that term was only ever used at Aldtown, amongst the maesters and archmaesters of the citadel. The people who lived through it called it the Lysen Spring. Dot for Spring was indeed a part of it. Early in 135 AC, the conclave sent forth its white ravens from Old Town to herald the end of one of the longest and cruelest winters that the Seven Kingdoms had ever known. Spring is ever a season of hope, rebirth, and renewal, and the spring of 135 AC was no different. The war in the Iron Islands came to an end, and Lord Cregan Stark of Winterfell borrowed a huge sum from the Iron Bank of Bravos to buy food and seed for his starving smallfolk. Only in the Vale did fighting continue. Furious at the refusal of the Aaron claimants to come to King's Landing and submit their dispute to the judgment of the regents, Lord Thaddeus Rowan sent a thousand men to Gultown under the command of his fellow regent, Sir Corwin Corbray, to restore the King's peace and settle the matter of succession. Meanwhile, King's Landing experienced a period of prosperity such as it had not seen in many years, in no small part thanks to Howe's Rogar of Lee. The Rogar Bank was paying rich returns on all the monies deposited with them, leading more and more lords to entrust the Lassini with their gold. Trade flourished as well, as ships from Tyrosh, Myr, Pentos, Bravos, and especially Lee crowded the docks along the Blackwater, offloading silks and spices, Myrish lace, jade from Carth, ivory from Sothorios, and many other strange and wondrous things from the ends of the earth, including luxuries seldom seen in the Seven Kingdoms before. Other port towns shared in the bounty, Duskendale, Maidenpool, Gultown, and White Harbor saw their trade expand as well, as did all town to the south, and even Lannisport upon the Sunset Sea. On Driftmark, the town of Hull experienced a rebirth. Scores of new ships were built and launched, and Lord Oakenfist's mother greatly expanded her own trading fleets, and began work on a palatial manse overlooking the harbor that Mushroom dubbed the Mouse House. Across the narrow sea, Lee itself was prospering under the Velvet Tyranny of Lysandro Rogare, who had taken on himself the style of First Magister for life. And when his brother Drazenko married Princess Aliandra Martel of Dornay, and was named by her prince consort and lord of the Stepstones, the ascendancy of House Rogare reached its apex. Men began to speak of Lysandro the Magnificent. During the first quarter of 135 AC, two momentous events were the occasion of great joy throughout the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. On the third day of the third moon of that year, the people of King's Landing woke to a sight that had not been seen since the dark days of the dance, a dragon in the skies above the city. Lady Reyna, at the age of 19, was flying her dragon, mourning, for the first time. That first day she circled once around the city before returning to the dragon pit, but every day thereafter she grew bolder and flew farther. Only once did Reyna land mourning inside the Red Keep, however, for not even the best efforts of Prince Viserys could persuade his brother the king to come see his sister fly, though Queen Daenera was so delighted with mourning that she was heard to say that she wanted a dragon of her own. Shortly thereafter, Morning carried Lady Reyna across Blackwater Bay to Dragonstone where, as she said, dragons and those who ride them are more welcome. Less than a fortnight later, Lara of Lee gave birth to a son, Prince Viserys's firstborn child. The mother was twenty years of age, the father only thirteen. Viserys named the child Aegon after his brother, the king, and placed a dragon's egg inside his cradle, as had become the custom with all trueborn children of House Targaryen. Aegon was anointed with the seven oils by Septon Bernard in the royal sept, and the bells of the city rang in celebration of his birth. Gifts were sent from every corner of the realm, though none so lavish as those bestowed upon the babe by his Licini uncles. In Lee, Lysandro the Magnificent declared a day of feasting in honor of his grandson, yet even in the midst of joy, whispers of discontent began to be heard. This new son of House Targaryen had been anointed into the faith, but soon enough the city heard that his mother meant to have him blessed by her own gods as well, and rumors of obscene ceremonies in the mermaid and blood sacrifice in Mager's Holfast began to be heard on the streets of King's Landing. The trouble might have ended there, with talk, but soon thereafter a series of disasters befell the realm and royal family, each following hard upon the heels of the other, until even men who mocked the gods, like Mushroom,
began to question whether the Seven had turned against House Targaryen and the Seven Kingdoms in their wrath. The first omen of the dark times to come was seen on Driftmark, when the dragon's egg presented to Lena Valerian upon her birth quickened and hatched. Her parents' pride and pleasure quickly turned to ash, however, the dragon that wriggled from the egg was a monstrosity, a wingless wyrm, maggot white and blind. Within moments of hatching, the creature turned upon the babe in her cradle and tore a bloody chunk from her arm. As Lena shrieked, Lord Oakenfist ripped the dragon off her, flung it to the floor, and hacked it into pieces. The news of this monstrous dragonbirth and its bloody aftermath were greatly troubling to King Aegon, and soon led to angry words between his grace and his brother. Prince Visory still had his own dragon's egg. Though it had never quickened, the prince had kept it with him throughout his years of exile and captivity, for it held great meaning for him. When Aegon commanded that no dragon's eggs were to be allowed in his castle, Visory's grew most wroth. Yet the king's will prevailed, as it must, the egg was sent to Dragonstone, and Prince Visory's refused to speak to King Aegon for a moon's turn. His grace was much dismayed by the quarrel with his brother, Mushroom tells us, but what happened next left him bereft and devastated. King Aegon was enjoying a quiet supper in his solar with his little queen, Daenera, and his friend Gemon Palehair and the dwarf was entertaining them with a silly song about a bear that drank too much, when the bastard boy began to complain of a cramping in his gut. Run fetch Grand Maester Munkin, the king commanded Mushroom. By the time the fool returned with the Grand Maester, Demon had collapsed and Queen Daenera was moaning, my belly hurts too. Demon had long served as King Aegon's food taster as well as his cupbearer, and Munkin soon declared that both he and the little queen were the victims of poisoning. The Grand Maester gave Daenera a powerful purgative, which most like saved her life. She retched uncontrollably throughout the night, wailing and writhing in pain, and was too drained and weak to leave her bed the next day, but she was cleansed. Munkin came too late for Demon Palehair, however. The boy died within the hour. Born a bastard in a brothel, King Cunny, had reigned briefly over his kingdom on a hill during the Moon of Madness, seen his mother put to death, and served Aegon III as cupbearer, whipping boy, and friend. He was thought to be but nine years old at his death. Afterward Grand Maester Munkin fed what remained of the supper to a cage of rats, and determined that the poison had been baked into the crust of the apple tarts. Fortunately, the king had never been especially fond of sweets, nor of any other food, if truth be told. The knights of the Kingsguard at once descended to the Red Keep's kitchens and took a dozen cooks, bakers, scullions, and serving girls into custody, delivering them to George Graceford, the Lord Confessor. Under torture, Seven confessed to attempting to poison the king. Dot but each account differed from the next, there was no agreement on where they got the poison, and none of the captives correctly named the dish that had been poisoned, so Lord Rowan reluctantly dismissed their confessions as, not fit to wipe my ass with. The hand was in a black state even before the poisoning, for he had only recently suffered his own personal tragedy when his young wife, the Lady Floris, died in childbirth. Though the king had spent less time with his cupbearer after his brother's return to Westeros, Demon Palehair's death nonetheless left Aegon inconsolable. One small good came from it, for it helped to heal the rift between the king and his brother Viserys, who broke his stubborn silence to comfort his grace in his grief, and sat with him by the queen's bedside. That proved little enough, however. Thereafter it was Aegon who was silent, for his old gloom had settled over him once again, and he seemed to lose all interest in his court and kingdom. 